outrageous for me to think that now, but that was a huge accomplishment for me. I was really good at networking with all those, you know, all the top dealers um, from different ethnicities. And when I would go into these rooms with these scary, intimidating men, I was thinking to myself, no, nah, man, you can't threaten me because I'm not scared to die. Because if anything, you know, you're going to be doing me a favour because I don't even want to be here on Earth. I actually want to be passed away because I want to be with my son, but I just can't bring myself to do it myself. So if you're going to shoot me, you're actually doing me a favour. There's nothing more scarier than someone that has got nothing to lose, and that was me through and through. With nothing to lose and desperate for her next fix, she began working the underbelly of Sydney, including setting up a brothel. Around the same time, Nix is part of a decision to rob a convenience store in Melbourne. This will be carried out by her partner at the time and another associate. We had had a big argument and it was over drugs because we had run out. I start flying down the road and he's behind me and I just went up on this curb and this roundabout and flipped my bike and I ended up on the road and things like that. Anyway, police turned up and I ended up going to Dame Phyllis Frost um, Women's prison in Melbourne. And that was a scary thing because I knew that I would have no access to drugs in that prison. My main thing was like, I cannot believe that I'm gonna get sober. I knew that everything that I had been running from for four and a half, five years was about to catch up with me. Forced to confront her demons and with time to really think, Nix goes cold turkey and has the shock realization that this is the first time she's been off meth in nearly five years. Oh, that's outrageous, because I haven't been three days clean for like nearly, you know, five years. And then another day would go by, oh my God, I'm four days clean, five days clean, six days clean. All I got done for was a stolen motorbike, but it was time served. The real challenge was once I was let outside the walls because I, I did say to myself, you know, are you sober because you, you can't get your hands on drugs? After 31 days, Nix is released from prison in Melbourne. But instead of moving back to Sydney, she stays on in Victoria. The Sunshine Courthouse got me a job working in this little coffee kind of truck outside the courthouse. This place is called Second Chance Cafe. They give people that have just come out of jail a second chance. That's what I did for the, the next three months while I was out of jail. I feel as though that really, really saved me because I had something to wake up to. I had purpose. And I feel as though if that courthouse didn't help me out the way that they did, I probably would have went off the rails again. Nix is set on staying on the straight and narrow but her housemate in Melbourne at the time has problems of his own. The fella that I was living with was on methamphetamine, and I was like, oh, my God. Um, but, you know, I thought, well, you know, Nicola, you're either going to really give this a go or you're going to go in that garage and you're going to get cooked again and you're going to lose all chances of ever going home and seeing your kids. And so what I would do is just stay in my bedroom. But one day I went into the garage for a, a cigarette and I saw a, a rock of methamphetamine. And um, I took it, I, I grabbed it, I put it in my pocket. I ended up hiding it in my room, but I thought to myself, what'd you do that for? You know, now the temptation is right there. Then one day, um, the courts had ordered me to go and see a counselor. So I went to this counseling session and I sat there for an entire hour reliving all my trauma. I started unearthing, unearthing, and she actually cut me off and told me, oh, our time's up. I ended up walking out of the counselling office and um, walking home, and oh, I felt like crap. I was thinking, what am I supposed to do with all this now? I've got all these emotions, and I feel like crying and things like that. I'm thinking about how I was suicidal. I'm thinking about, you know, the loss of my son. By the time I got back to my bedroom, I went, I grabbed that rock, I crushed it up, and I just did a big, big, long sweep. Within a few minutes, all those feelings were gone, and I was just sitting in that room, cooked. I was cooked as. I stayed awake all night long. The next morning, I was becoming very paranoid because 
you know, now I've got to be in public. I've got my boss at this coffee cart, and uh, anyway, I had these big sunglasses on because my eyes were full beaming. Got straight onto it, start making the coffee. Next minute I hear, morning, Nicola, and it was my lawyer. And he says to me, Nicola, you've got your first drug and alcohol uh, counselling today. And I'm thinking, oh my lord. I went into my counselling session with my drug and alcohol counsellor. He sat down and I said, I need to tell you something. He said, what? I said, I am cooked out of my brains. My lawyer comes in, he says, there, yeah. my boss is sitting there, and my lawyer says to me, and how are you feeling today, Nicola? And I said, I feel like crap. I feel I'm filled with so many emotions. I feel guilty. I feel like a disappointment. He says, who, you, who do you feel like you've disappointed? I said, you guys. He said, don't feel like that. The only one you've disappointed is yourself. They really were surprised at my honesty, um, but I was so disappointed in myself that I actually couldn't hold it in. And I have been absolutely 100% stone cold sober ever since that day. So Nix returns to Aotearoa, drug free. But how do you rekindle relationships with children having not seen them in years? It was very hard in the beginning because I gotta prove it to their father. He's gotta be able to trust them in my care. When I first got back, he didn't want anything to do with me. The things that he witnessed of me prior to him bringing the children back to New Zealand, like, I was pretty scary, I was pretty out the gate. So I was just grateful that um, he was allowing for me to see them, whether it was supervised or unsupervised. He continuously told them that mum was sick and that she was trying to get better. Um, and I'm very grateful that he said that. And when I got back into the children's life and things like that, and they'd say, Mum, where were you? I'd say, oh, Mum was sick because when Alaska died, Mum couldn't deal with it. As this was playing out, her use of social media was starting to take off. She sets up CWK, Cooked Fano Kōrero, and her following goes through the roof. It wasn't until recently I decided to change it to um, courage, wisdom and knowledge because I realised as, you know, as the time went on, I was starting to evolve. I was no longer this cooked, random, no-teeth-looking girl, you know, that's just gotten off the drugs. Dear Lord, please help me out for my day. Oh, I know I always ask. Um... But when I get there, I can hook you up, I can help you out, shit, I can, I can clean. Well, I don't want to clean, but I will, if you ask me to, I will. But I just need some help through the day, because you know what, I'm tired as. You need courage, especially for me, because there was a lot of people that had no faith in me and things like that. I needed the, to have the courage to say, I don't care what you think, I'm still going to carry on. Wisdom. You need to be vigilant about what is going on all around you, you know, and you need to be constantly open to learning because at the end of the day, I don't care who you are, you don't know everything about everything. So you need to be open to gaining wisdom and sharing wisdom. And I feel as though for a lot of us that have been through dark paths or dark alleyways, we've come out of that with a hell of a lot of knowledge why not share that and help lift other people up and encourage them on their own journeys of self-discovery? I feel as though looking back at it now, yeah, things could have been done differently. Oh, an abundance. To be honest, my son could not have died. Um, but that's just not how it worked. It's not how our story was written. I could sit here and, and think about, oh man, I wish I didn't do that, I wish I didn't do that. But the thing is, it's, it's been done and uh, I'm not gonna sit around and dwell about it. I'm gonna really push and make sure that I make up for those five years. It's time for me to focus on building a future for my family.